Coming up, 40 Under 40, recognizing outstanding Native leaders. We'll hear about the variety of careers and the people being honored in this year's class. Plus, we learn about the nationally acclaimed artist and how her son is following her footsteps. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from Indian Country Today. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Kuwatsi Hopa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Alia Chavez. In Colorado, the U.S. government is approving a name change for a prominent mountain. Last week, a federal panel approved renaming the peak after a Cheyenne woman who facilitated relations between settlers and tribes in the early 19th century. Mestahe Mountain was previously named after the S-word. Now, officials say it will honor the influential translator who worked in what is current day southern Colorado. The name change is part of a larger campaign nationwide to replace derogatory sites. Tiana Limpy is the director of the Northern Cheyenne's Tribal Historic Preservation Office. She says she hopes the change inspires people to learn about indigenous cultures and languages. This is the first of several geographic name changes being considered by a Colorado state panel. The Canadian government is pledging up to $40 billion for First Nations kids. The funding will also go to reform the country's child welfare system. In 2016, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found Ottawa racially discriminated against First Nations children by underfunding the system. The tribunal further ruled in 2019 that the discrimination was, quote, willful and reckless and a worst case scenario under federal human rights law. APTN reports roughly half of the money will go to the victims of discrimination and some family members and the other half toward reform. If negotiations stay on track, the nearly 15 year old legal battle could see a resolution by the end of this year. For 73 years, natives in Rapid City, South Dakota, have fought for ownership of some of the land that used to be part of the local Indian boarding school. But as Stuart Huntington reports, the finish line is still just out of grasp. In 1948, Congress doled out some 1,200 prime acres from the closed Rapid City Indian boarding school. None of them went to natives, even though by law they were eligible. Not long ago, researchers unearthed potential deed violations on three parcels that brought the city to the negotiating table. The boarding school land group and I have been visiting and uh, negotiating around this issue for five plus years. Uh, we're at the 26th mile in this marathon. We are so close to this finish line. Uh, the only thing left to know is whether we finish first or last. Last year, the city council asked for a draft plan to exchange land and money equaling $20 million to settle the deed violation claims. This week, the council had its first chance to act on part of that plan when a Blue Ribbon Citizen panel recommended that the city give the boarding school land group $15 million to build an Indian center. The council balked and tabled the idea until at least January. Land team members were saddened but not surprised and vowed to continue the push. We're not giving up. Uh, this work is, you know, the work of our ancestors and our grandmothers, uh, you know, centuries and decades into the making. The fight for pieces of the boarding school land property is awash with emotion. Researchers identified unmarked graves of children who died at the school that operated from 1898 to 1933. This fight, though, is for those children and to make sure that they are always remembered and is for this land here and to remind our community of our history. 
So for now, the seven-decade wait continues until the city council takes up the issue again. But the council doesn't hold all the cards. The Indian volunteers can turn to the Department of the Interior, which by law retains the right to repossess parcels not used according to statute. This process, known as reversion, is few people's first choice for resolving the issues. Going through a reversion process, I think that will be a setback, a major setback for uh, race relations. In Rapid City, South Dakota, this is Stuart Huntington, Indian Country Today. Well, congratulations are in order for a nine-year-old native entrepreneur. Over the weekend, Miles Sickey was presented the award for highest business potential at the Acton Children's Business Fair in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The fair is a one-day event where children create a brand or product, then build a marketing strategy and sell it to the event's 500 customers. Miles had previously created his own small business selling fire starter sticks made from pine that he found in his barn. We found some in our barn, in the back of our barn, and my grandpa said, can you chop some up for me? And when he came to pick it up, he said, you should sell this. It's a really good fire starter. And, and I started it for a little while and then during, and then I quit. And during the pandemic, I started it back up again. He has found success. So a $5 bundle, a $20 bag, and a $100 crate. I've sold over 40 bags in probably over 30 bundles. His matchstick contains a natural organic resin found in pine trees and can be used in windy or wet conditions. Miles frequently advises customers to keep the fire starter sticks in their emergency kits. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Aliyah Chavez. Coming up, from working in policy and tribal tourism, we'll learn about the National Center's annual event to honor young leaders. Plus, every major museum in the U.S. has displayed the art of John Quick to see Smith. Now her son is carving out his own place in art history. We'll learn more about this mother and son duo later in our newscast. Each year, the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development honors 40 outstanding Native leaders who are under the age of 40. The award winners are American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian leaders who dedicate themselves to making significant contributions in their communities. Chris James is the president and CEO of the National Center, and he joins us today to tell us more about this year's class of winners. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Hello, hello. So I know it's hard to start. There's 40 award recipients, but tell us about a few of them. Absolutely. Well, again, we're so excited uh, to have had uh, our class of 2021 uh, announced a few months ago and had our gala on Friday night, last Friday night. Uh, so a few really, they're, they're, like you said, there's so many great leaders. And overall, we have had 520 leaders over the past 13 years, so that's pretty exciting. Just some highlights of this year's class. Rainey Williams, she's the legislative assistant to Representative Sharice Davids. Uh, we have Heidi Tocchini. She's senior advisor to Secretary Holland, Office of, uh, of DOI. Uh, we had Angelina Casanova. She is... Uh, the chairperson of Command Holdings, which is a tribally owned company. So that's just to, to name a few. Yeah, and that's really exciting. And I love that a lot of these award winners are making contributions in their communities, of course, at these very high levels, as you mentioned, with um, people who work in Congress and, of course, Secretary Deb Holland. But also there's a lot of people who are doing grass works, sorry, grass roots work as well. Um, and it also looks like there was a lot of women in this year's class. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we really strive uh, to have a diverse, uh, not only geographically, but a diverse population with uh, where folks are from, from Alaska all the way to the East Coast, uh, you know, down in the South. So we really, the Southwest as well. And you're right. I mean, it's not just uh, tribal leaders, and it's not just doctors and lawyers. We've had 
um, advocates and uh, folks that focus on uh, nonprofits. One in particular, Noah Blue Elk Hotchkiss, is, uh, he has an or organization, Tribal Adaptive Organization, and it, uh, his organization works with, with folks with challenges or disabilities. So, I mean, we have so many great folks that uh, have started nonprofits, have been business leaders, and who work for the tribe and are, are tribal leaders uh, in their tribe, uh, like Jordan Dresser, who's Northern Arapaho Tribal Chairman. That is wonderful. You mentioned earlier that the Gay Love course to honor these award winners was um, held very recently. Tell us about some of the programming that happened there and um, overall, how would you sort of character characterize how the night went? Well, it was a wonderful night. Uh, it was hosted by uh, our auction Indian community here in Arizona. Uh, we had uh, about uh, 34 uh, awardees represented. Um, and, and just really the energy uh, in the room was amazing. We followed all of, of course, COVID guidelines as we need to be. Uh, but the whole idea of the celebration and patting these awardees on the back and, and really giving, handing them, every awardee got to go across the stage. We handed them an award. Um, two of our board members who were former 40 under 40, they were the MCs. So, you know, just our, the energy that we had to, for this awesome celebration of these leaders um, really uh, resonated. And it, it really, uh, I know that the recipients felt that energy and, and they'll be able to take that energy home and, and spread it out through, through the holiday season because it, it was just such a great, uh, impactful night. And what an awesome opportunity for some of these award winners to, you know, attend some of their first in-person events in Indian country and, you know, for it to be on an occasion just like this. It's so exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I think that's sometimes folks felt uh, that it was their, their first time traveling or their first time uh, being uh, in an area. And, and, and we, we did put in some requirements for, for social distancing and mask wearing, um, but that did not overshadow, uh, you know, what a great night we have, we had. Tell us about some of the past award winners. I know that there's some pretty big names. What are they up to now? And um, you know, how do they sort of set the standard for award winners today and in the future? Well, like I mentioned, we had uh, two of our board members, which I have to mention, Lillian Sparks Robinson, who used to um, uh, work in the Obama administration. Uh, she has her own company. Uh, that she does consulting with, a uh, very successful company out of the D.C. area. William Lowe, uh, both of them were class of 2010, I believe. William Lowe it was also a National Center Board member. He is uh, on uh, tribal, he's in, in, on tribal council at, uh, in his tribe at Muskogee Creek. So just those two examples not only are doing things in uh, for Indian country or, or you know, uh, developing uh, businesses, but they also um, they also work uh, for their community and are board members for the National Center. So that's just two great examples. We have, like I said, 520. Uh, so there's so many. I, I, I'm thinking about 100 names, but uh, there's so many people are doing so many great things. And of those 520 um, past award winners, um, tell us how did this award actually start? So in 2009, the award started with the National Center as a recognition. Uh, it was the National Center's 40th year uh, anniversary. And, and to celebrate that 40th year anniversary, uh, we decided to do uh, 40 under 40 to go along with that. And really just there wasn't a lot out there recognizing uh, Native American specific 40 under 40. So that's why we felt to, to recognize business leaders and recognize tribal leaders and recognize doctors and lawyers and CEOs. And, and it really took off from there. That is wonderful. Um, I want to talk about, you know, as folks are listening to this interview, they might be thinking of someone to nominate or nominate themselves. Tell us how does that process work? So the class of 2022 nominations uh, should open to mid to end January. Anybody that is 39 
on January 1st, 2022 can be nominated. So, uh, so that's, that's exciting. Uh, the nomination process is, is fairly easy. It's an online process. There is some recommendation letters that go uh, along with it. Um, but uh, uh, it's a competitive process, but it's, it's uh, something that opens up in January. Talking about a competitive process, what is the selection criteria like? Is it a group of people who you all select to choose these winners or what does that look like? The National Center Board Board of Directors, we have right now 15 board members. Uh, there is a select committee led by Lillian Sparks Robinson, and they actually go through every application. They read every recommendation letter. They have a scoring metrics that they use based on various criteria, such as community involvement, leadership, uh, academic, uh, you know, some, some of our folks are professors, so if they have academic accolades. So there's a whole uh, litmus test uh, and, and probably about six or seven categories that folks use. So it, it is, uh, the committee goes through, they, 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 they go through every application and, and they make recommendations based on a set of criteria. One thing that's really interesting to me about this award is that people can nominate themselves. So if someone's under 40 and they say, hey, I really want to be recognized for this, you can actually nominate yourself to apply. Um, something that's also really interesting, I think, is that I think in a lot of Native communities, it's really hard to think of yourself in that way and say, you know what, I'm going to nominate myself because that's just, um, you know, sometimes different from how, how we were raised in a lot of our communities. Um, what advice do you have for those individuals? who may be on the fence about nominating themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's, a, it's okay to pat yourself on the back sometimes. And, and, you know, it's also okay to be humble. And I think those, like you said, in our communities, sometimes those two don't always go hand in hand. And, and I, I think we all need to sit back and say, you know, I, I did something special and finding that energy inside of myself and saying, you know what, I, I, I am going to take the risk and I am going to nominate myself for this award because I know I did something good and, and that's, that's okay to do. And, and it, it doesn't mean you're vain uh, and it's okay to, to, to sit back and, and still be humble, but still recognize your own accomplishments. And I think that's very important to do. And what do you say to the folks who maybe have applied and um, didn't get selected and, you know, they want to try again, maybe this is their second or third time. What do you say to those individuals? You know, keep on going. I think everybody that every application we got this year could have been a 40 under 40. So there, you know, there, it, if, if you didn't get the award, keep trying uh, and keep reaching for for those goals that you may have. Keep doing work with your community. Uh, keep, keep focusing on uh, maybe a task at hand that, 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 that helps, uh, helps someone or helps your community. I mean, so I, I don't give up. Uh, this is a great award and everybody that's, I wish we could give out uh, 200 a year, um, but I would recommend folks still apply even if, if they didn't get selected. Sure. Well, Chris James, thank you so much. Thank you. When we come back, we'll look at the art of John Quick to see Smith and the son who was following in her footsteps. Neil Ambrose Smith grew up surrounded by the art his mother made. She is a nationally acclaimed creative, John Quick to see Smith, who has been making art for the last 50 years. Her works have been shown in every major museum in the U.S. Sandra Hale Shulman recently profiled the mother and son duo, and she joins us today to tell us about their latest projects. Hi, Sandra. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you for asking. So tell us about, uh, first, John Quick to see Smith. Well, John uh, is Salish, and she actually grew up very poor, and, and she was toiling in uh, as a farmer, as a picker in fields, and very deprived of culture and art in her life. But she thought she wanted to be an artist. She managed to go to school. And they were telling her, well, what are you going to, why are you going to be, there's no such thing as women artists. What are you going to, why are you studying this? You can't do it. 
she managed to go to graduate school, started painting, and then they started telling her this doesn't look native, whatever that means. Maybe they were expecting something more classical, uh, Indian chiefs, I mean, who knows, but they were telling her all these things and she was not discouraged. She said, this is what I want to do. And then she got involved in 70s activism. She saw that natives were becoming much more uh, outspoken about the way things were going on the reservations and how the natives that had left were being treated in cities. So all of that started becoming part of her art. And she focused on the, the map of North America. So you'll notice in almost all of her art, she puts in uh, you know, sayings and pop culture references and mixes them with sort of stereotypical native uh, idioms and, and things that people would say to her and that she heard. So a really strong, powerful work of art. And it wasn't until about age 30 that she really got to start exhibiting and doing what she wanted to do. So that was around, yeah, around the 80s, and, um, late 70s, 80s. So then her son um, grew up seeing all this and seeing the struggle. And he calls it that he's got the disease, he says, that he ended up wanting to be an artist also. And now he's his mother's advisor and helper, which is really interesting. You had the chance to sit down with the two of them. Um, tell us about uh, John. How old is she? And you know what? What did you take away from being able to speak to her? Um, she's eighty-one now. Uh, actually, they, they are in separate places. She is in, uh, in in outside of Albuquerque at her studio, and the son uh, lives elsewhere. And he's a teacher. So they live separately. Uh, she's kind of in heavy studio mode because she's preparing for several big shows. Uh, she's got a very big show coming up in 2023, which we can't talk about yet because uh, it's a secret yet, but we'll be able to announce it soon. And so she's in lockdown mode working on that. The Sun has a current show at the Musula Art Museum and she has a current show at a, a very established gallery in New York City, which is handling some of the top native artists in the business, which is a big deal as a mainstream gallery. But what I took away from her, I was very surprised that she was um, still in a way uh, a bit conflicted. And she talked about how <laughs> when someone comes to her studio to fix something or a repair person, something not related to the art world, she doesn't tell them the truth about what she does. She says that she's a, a teacher and this is just a hobby where she's been making a living off of this for decades, but still people say to her, oh, my aunt paints dog pictures, you know, maybe you two should get together. I mean, this woman is selling artwork for hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe over a million certain pieces. And you know, she's still embarrassed that, that uh, she's an artist in some ways because of the reaction. So I was very surprised to hear that. I was surprised to read that in your story as well. She really talked about how for a very long time, um, dominant society didn't really deem artists as something that was like a, like a worthy job. And it sounds like that's what she's still dealing with. She still feels that. She said she still uh, doesn't tell the truth to people about what she's doing in his career. And she's ready to have a major retrospective at a major American museum. I mean, it's, an, it's the first time they've done this for a, a female artist, native artist. So it's a very big deal. And still she has, she harbors that kind of, uh, I don't think it's an embarrassment. I think she just doesn't want to hear the negativity or hear uh, the weird feedback, you know, like, oh, my aunt hates dog pictures and, you know, maybe you should get together. Just, I think she just wants to avoid that. So she doesn't talk about it so much. Sure. Well, to have a retrospective at age 81, I'm sure all of us are going to be very excited to see um, everything that is in it. I want to switch gears. We don't have a lot of time left to talk about her son. So tell us about this app that her son made. Um, it's Ideas for Artists. It's called like 100 Ideas for Artists. And he, uh, he just puts up different things that he hopes will spark people's imaginations. He's a professor. Uh, he's a working artist, but he's also a professor. So these were things that he was using over many years, and he decided to put it up in an app so it could be shared by anyone instantly and more widely. 
So it's just things to spark people's ideas, maybe something they hadn't thought about that they could use in their art. And there's a hundred of them, lots of them. You mentioned earlier that Neil is a, a mentor of sorts for his mother. Tell us about that. Um, I think as, as he grew to find himself in his career and taking inspiration with her, uh, I think that he, they switched roles in a sense, you know, he kind of became more of a caretaker, not caretaker, she's not ailing, but uh, taking care of her and helping her with things in the studio. And, you know, she was of the generation that didn't grow up with computers so much. So he helps her bring a lot into the digital age and monitor things. And he said he gives her, you know, feedback and if the direction of a painting is right, he helps her with technical issues such as if it's a complex piece that needs a, a different kind of frame or an unusual hanging method, he's there to support her and all of that, which is interesting. No. Sandra, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And you can read Sandra's story by visiting IndianCountryToday.com and searching for the headline, Acclaimed Mother-Son Artists Create Together and Apart. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news and updates, visit us anytime at IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Malia Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.